What if the next big technology was actually a really old technology? The processors in your computer or phone are digital. They think in ones and zeros. But this processor thinks in waves. This is an analog processor, and it might allow us to totally rethink computing from the ground up. Oh, wow, you can cut through anything. For the last few decades, digital computing has always been driven by software, and it became very easy to use and very easy to build applications. But all of the information in the world is natively analog, and so what analog processing allows us to do is understand and potentially inference and gather insights from that data in its rawest form. But just like the digital processors you know, it can still be programmed with software, and that's kind of a big deal. Imagine being able to build new devices that use AI and machine learning algorithms, but yet use one thousandth of the energy that they use from a digital perspective. And so you get all those benefits of analog, the power, the efficiency, the accuracy, but now you can use a software to program it very quickly. Does all processing need to be digital? How will analog processors change the way our computers work and interact with us? This is Hard Reset, a series about rebuilding our world from scratch. The first computers ever made were analog. Think ancient Greece. Later on, we had slide rules, and in the 19th century, we developed analog computers that calculated how things like the tides would change over time or solve differential equations. We met the folks from Aspinity to learn about analog processors. Analog has not gone away. I mean, it, every iPhone uses analog to collect data and analog to transmit data in the form of RF. So analog has always been there, but it's been relegated to those primary capabilities. Analog processors were surpassed by digital processors, mainly because digital could be manufactured more easily and they could be programmed with software. This made them far more flexible and adaptable. But what about a software programmable analog processor? Well, that's what this is. The challenge with analog has always been when you put a certain input in for, for the same circuit in a different silicon, you might get a slightly different output. And we call that voltage offset. So 2.1 and 1.9 aren't exactly the same. You want it to be two. And Aspinity has solved uh, a major hurdle. And through our software, we're able to make fine-tune adjustments so that that chip gets a two at the output, this chip gets a two at the output. But we also solved a key problem with regards to use model and how easy it is to use. And so we're now able to program an analog processor from Aspinity in the same way that we do digital. That means the signals from all the sensors that these chips are connected to don't need to be converted into ones and zeros. They can just go straight in, and you can write the software that directs the chip about how to interpret those signals. That's sort of huge, but don't take my word for it. Jared here has a little more insight as a product designer at Argo Design here in Austin, Texas. Aspinity has slayed a dragon here. And I've been going along blissfully thinking like the history of computing is set and settled. We will do digital, we will do binary. And it turns out that all along, analog has been slowly creeping along. Now that we've solved the, the stability and programmability issues of analog computing, we're gonna see a, a quick reset to the entire architecture of computing. Right now, we spend tons of energy breaking analog signals into digital signals, just so that our computers can understand them. And by tons of energy, we're not being hyperbolic. Think about all the sensors in your phone, your house, your car, at work. Most of them collect analog signals that have to be converted into digital signals, and usually back into analog signals so that we can hear them or see them. We expect 30 billion devices like this by the end of the decade. Every one of these will be computing on data, and it takes tremendous amounts of energy to have these always on computing. All that energy we spend converting signals adds up. In fact, the energy consumption of digital computers is rising faster than the rate at which we create energy. That's a problem. It allows these products to be more power intelligent, so we can really understand right at the sensor input whether the data is relevant or not. And then that drives everything after that to take advantage of that efficiency. 
This technology isn't meant to replace digital computers, but it could mean we use them much more strategically. We can still have a, a combination of analog and digital locally, but we want to be able to use that analog as you're always on computing and then wake up the digital as necessary or wake up and send data to the cloud as necessary. Think of it this way. How often do you change the batteries in your smart TV's remote control? Well, even those batteries are slowly being nibbled away at by the digital processors that sit and listen for your voice to command them. And all this is just so you can say, you know, hey TV, I want to watch a rom-com with Matthew McConaughey. You really can't make it five minutes into a conversation in Austin without someone bringing up Matthew McConaughey. All right, all right, all right. Oh, Christ. How you doing? Anyway. With analog computing, it can be listening continuously for that wake word that's using almost no electricity, never doing the analog digital conversion, and then it can wake up a more expensive system to do the work of the request. That means that same remote control could last 10 or even 100 times longer on the same batteries. Or you could just use much smaller batteries and get the same functionality. And you can virtually do any audio, right? This is a glass break detector. This also is for automotive glass break as well. Right. So you could potentially build the kind of filters and decision tree that can say, oh, that was glass breaking, that's a window. This is a car window, tempered glass breaking. And then based on whether or not it hits one of those priority glass breaks, it can send that signal to the digital chip, which communicates via either Wi-Fi or cell signal. Exactly. Or Once we make the decision, we, we go ahead and send the, send the trigger right. out to whomever, a call center, in some cases directly to the authorities. Hey Siri, the glass is broken. I can't hold it. You want to hold it? Yeah, let's see what happens. Right. What if I'm talking over it while you do it? That is a filter out. So here I'm going to talk. I'm going to say, this is hard reset. A theory is about, well, that really, yeah. I'm kind of surprised that it could differentiate between the two because a lot of people say my voice sounds like breaking glass. It may not be a major item that gets solved, but all of these little things where you're using energy inefficiently add up. Where this really starts to impact society at scale isn't your remote control. It's your pipes, your solar power plants, your cars on a piece of equipment like a stacker, which is one of those conveyor belts that runs dirt up and makes piles. And there's something on the order of a half a million of them in operation every day. And just, if you have a chipset that can run for years on battery power with enough machine learning intelligence to listen to a vibration and determine that it's not just a vibration, but the type that indicates a bearing is going out. And then you could use that information to find out what it would cost to repair a bearing. When you think about the whole system, it's not just that the chipset uses less power, it's that because it uses less power, it creates a new computing architecture where we can get more value, the insights, with less resources. Monitoring all these things with digital systems would be impractical. But with analog systems, it starts to seem achievable. So picture a scenario where analog computers orchestrate the activity of digital computers. This would mean better sensing systems and more of them in places where it can make a difference. And of course, all this sensing of the real world can be done with far less energy than the digital systems we currently use. You probably won't ever have an all analog computer. Some things like audio devices might become mostly analog. That would probably be music to the ears of your vinyl loving friend but most implementations would be about lending the best strengths of analog and digital. For example, heart monitoring is perfect for analog computers. Our heartbeat is an analog signal. And with power efficient, tiny sensors, more people could be monitored effectively. If the analog portion ever detects an anomaly, it can wake up a digital component that communicates with the cloud or contacts a healthcare provider. Once you have these kind of chipsets, you're going to see an explosion of people looking to create new kinds of analog sensors. This would allow me to create an entire architecture around voice computing in the home because I could look at the faucet and say, turn on, and the stove wouldn't turn on because I wasn't looking at it. It's this idea of it'll be a very low energy deployment of all of these insight gathering devices that are very specific to you and there's no middleman going to the cloud necessarily or no middleman that's monitoring it for you, it can come to you. We're constantly relying on more and more intelligent devices in our lives. 
But analog intelligence might totally change the way those devices understand us.